Uh, I'm David Barris. This is David Sutton, and we are here um, to interview each other to, as part of the Society for the Anthropology of Food Nutrition series on the history, development, and future of food anthropology, or the anthropology of food and nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, the videos so far have been, um, I guess I would say, historic figures uh, in uh, food anthropology. Um, I don't know if we want to consider ourselves that. Um, but I think it's part of an ongoing discussion of where the field is going and where the discipline is going. Um, and if we think of it that way, that means there's lots and lots of other people to interview. That's right. Um, so what I wanted to start out with, though, is something that isn't really food related, although it, it's a question of how you get to food mm -hmm. in anthropology. Um, in anthropology, uh, there are, I, I'm going to make a wide generalization here, two kinds of people. Mm -hmm. Those who come to anthropology because they love anthropology, and those who come to anthropology because they are really interested in studying some place or thing, and they think anthropology will provide them with the tools to do that. Um, and I'm curious as to which one you are. Yeah, uh, I, I would I would say I, I would have to like combine those two mm -hmm. because I, I did really, um, it was partly my, my love of Greece mm -hmm. that got me into wanting to do field work there. And in particular, this island, Kalimnos, that I've done most of my research on. Uh, and that kind of went back to childhood starting with Greek mythology and then um, my parents taking me to Greece when I was 12 and discovering Greek food because uh, growing up in New York at the time, I mean, we didn't go to Queens, so we didn't go to Greek restaurants. There weren't Greek restaurants mm -hmm. in Manhattan. There were diners, but not uh, kind of what... Uh, so I didn't know Greek food until I went to Greece and I, and I loved that too. Uh, and um, and so I wanted to continue my conne connection with Greece. I ended up doing a study abroad program when I was 17 on this island, Kalimnos, uh, where we were not only learning about Greece and history and culture and all of that, but we were apprenticed to uh, families and, and businesses in the community. And so I, it really was kind of like a little anthropological mm -hmm. experience when I was 17. So I had that kind of particularistic interest in Greece in the back of my mind. Um, and then anthropology, um, you know, I imbibed with my mother's milk uh, and, and my mother and so many friends that we had were anthropologists and so I was getting that perspective very young and the kind of interest in cultural difference which always was f fascinating to me I, and, and I think there was a connection because I was always looking for different food experiences too. Um, but at the same time having uh, your parent as an anthropologist was in some ways I, I didn't want to go into anthropology at a certain point because it seemed like I was just following in the family footsteps and and uh, so I had some ambivalence there but it was really kind of the thought of doing field work in Greece I think that eventually drove me to embrace uh, what uh, seems to be inevitable. It is interesting. We have that in common, of course, your mother, mm -hmm. in that uh, I think you pointed this out to me once that she was, attended both of our dissertation defenses, right. albeit for different reasons. Right. I mean, she was your mother, and in my case, she was on my committee. The uh, other question, of course, that um, I have sort of broadly is having to do with doing fieldwork in one place all this time. Mm -hmm. A lot of anthropologists change places and do field work in multiple sites and of course a lot of anthropologists focus on one place or one region for their entire career um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of course mm -hmm. to both of those um, you've done almost all of your work in Kalimnos and in Greece um, and so I'm, I'm curious as to what you think that has how that's impacted your work how you think that's what's the importance of having made that choice do you think of it as a choice even yeah, um, I, I mean, and I think uh, one, once again, there's a lot of ambivalences that go into that, but 
I, I feel like um, I've I've always been interested in questions of continuity and change, mm-hmm. and and I felt like um, that I wanted to in some ways document what I saw as the to use an expression from my mother again, changing continuities on Kalimnos and how I saw things uh, over time there. And so I feel like that I I did have a kind of theoretical commitment to long-term field work just because of my interest in, and also I started out not with food, but with the question of historical consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I was really interested in how people think about their own past and I wanted to kind of have that long-term perspective to to really get at that. Um, I think there are lots of practical issues that um, that you face that might push you to do um, field work in different places or one place. Um, for, um, I, one of my mentors, Michael Hertzfeld, was always pushing me to like choose a second research site and uh, and one of the reasons I resisted that is because I knew I couldn't learn another language <laughs> um, and uh, and but I but I also ended up doing some research in the US mm-hmm. and I felt like that was a second research site um, but and I think that you know the personal reason for it is, just because uh, I had known this island and the people who became close informants and friends since I was 17, I had a commitment to them too. Mm-hmm. And so it was really the sense of keep, to keep coming back and keep those relationships going that drove me also to uh, to not move away from, from Kalimnos and Greece. So a lot of your work has really focused very narrowly on Kalimnos. Mm-hmm. But every now and then, like when you talk about um, the Greek crisis, when you talk about food media, mm-hmm. um, you expand your focus to the rest of Greece, which I think is really interesting. So what are the, are there, do you spend a lot of time doing field work in the rest of Greece, or how does that work in terms of your perspective? Yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's a really... Uh, it's it's tricky. Um, I think it, it's partly just um, knowing uh, what other anthropologists have done in Greece, um, reading their work carefully, mm-hmm. and and doing that comparison and contrast. Um, you're right. Uh, Kalimnos uh, is not just like right on the. Uh, border with Turkey, but is distinctive in a number of ways from other parts of Greece. Uh, All of those islands only became part of Greece in 1947-48. They were the last territorial acquisition of the modern Greek state. Uh, So they have this really interesting history. They were under Italian colonial rule for most of the first half of the 20th century, uh, and of course before that under Ottoman rule. And, uh, and it developed into all kinds of interesting things, including uh, something that I've spent a lot of time thinking about, which is this, um, this very strong matrifocal patterns on the island, which are different from the rest of Greece. Um, and so uh, I... I um, but but you're absolutely right in because of the Greek crisis I had to think about uh, I mean I was always thinking about Kalimnos I, w- I was trying to get away from the idea of insularity just because it's an island doesn't mean it's insular uh, uh, as we normally use the word because the Kalimnians were always very outward oriented mm-hmm. and so even in my first research uh, on Greece, I, I ended up writing a lot about um, 
the war in Yugoslavia because that was something that was on people's minds very much, even more at that particular time than Turkey, which was their neighbor. They were talking about what was happening in Yugoslavia. And, and so I had to, you know, follow that up by reading, uh, trying to understand something about the war in Yugoslavia so I could discuss it with them. Um, so I was always kind of uh, trying to broaden out from Kalimnos in, in, in some kind of imaginary, that is, their imaginary of the world, mm -hmm. thinking about that. But the, uh, but the financial crisis uh, really got me thinking much more about the economics of the European Union and some of the uh, ways that that was really impacting people in Greece, and again, Kalimnos, but differently from other parts of Greece. It is funny, though, because when I listen to you, I'm thinking, in many respects, some of these problems are exactly the kinds of issues that your mother also researched. The I idea of islands, right. first of all, but also the matrifocality issue. Um, and then, of course, the broader sort of political economic context. Those are all signature Connie Sutton issues. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, not. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's, you know, it's really fascinating. Well, that was, I think that was really, it was her influence and the influence of her and, and her circle of uh, f feminist anthropologists, mm -hmm. including Eleanor Leacock especially, uh, had me thinking about that um, in when I was training as a graduate student mm -hmm. and also to kind of, as a balance from, for the kind of less political anthropology that I was being taught at the University of Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, if, if, I, if I would jump ahead to like thinking about food, uh, in some ways my mother had very little influence in my interest in food because she didn't think food was that important or interesting, certainly uh, intellectually, but um, but all that she kind of had taught me about um, thinking about gender roles and kind of taking apart um, the kind of public and private distinctions that that so have so long bedeviled our uh, academic thinking about gender and even in anthropological work on gender like Ortner and Rosaldo, and she was very critical of that approach to gender that still kind of separated mm -hmm. public and private and really wanting to think about uh, what women were doing as significant and, imp uh, and imp important, which led me to think about cooking as something that um, might be undervalued in our culture or in our academic culture, but that had a real significance that was interesting anthropologically. Certainly it is something that has become more, uh, people have become more interested in it. In, in particular, they become more interested in men's public cooking, of course. Mm -hmm. But there is more attention, probably thanks to exactly what you're talking about, to um, women's domestic cooking as well as women's public cooking. Mm -hmm. All right, so you, you said your initial interest was in history and memory. Mm -hmm. And that seems to show up almost immediately in your book about, um, and I'm blanking on the title, about, you know, um, remembrance of repasts, there we go, of um, using food to think about memory in, uh, in, in Kalimnos. Of course, it kind of starts with the Proust story, which comes up all the time. Um, but did that uh, was that did that start out as something that was going to focus on food, or how did you get to that specific topic? For? It was really kind of like the in the way that uh, I think anthropologists experience this, like finding in the margins of their mm -hmm. field notes this other thing, and and that was very much for me since I was asking people to talk about the past and, and reflect on their relationship to the past, that food just kept coming up and, uh, and not just as one of the joys of field work um, 
sharing and eating food with people that they were cooking and and, and people you know and seeing the importance of food as a way of connecting with people but specifically uh, that phrase that I heard from people um, eat so that you remember calumnus um, that's I was like wait okay <laughs> something's going on here and then the stories that people would tell I would ask them about World War II and they would say you know I was eating this uh, bag of plums or peaches or something and then somebody came by and I, and I was like but that that was like 40 50 years ago how do you remember that and it was just very naturally woven into their stories mm -hmm. whether whether it was accurate or not I wasn't as interested as the fact that it was there and so really understanding why was it there what was it doing there and why this connection of food and memory what could we say about it um, beyond the kind of just Proustian thing that oh yeah there's some connection between food and memory well what could we say about it anthropologically that's where I started to look and see not too much being said about this um, but um, but the of the few things that I found written about it one was uh, Nadia Saramataki's work uh, and so it kind of made me think oh there's something going on particularly in Greece and Greek culture obviously not only in Greek culture in many places but maybe in some places in different ways than others so that was kind of an anthropological angle that made me think well we should explore um, this food memory connection as a cultural product of some kind. Do you think people in, in Kalimnos are particularly self-conscious about that connection because you mentioned that phrase or is there a kind of linking in the way they or maybe like you said many people uh, just use food as a way to mark the past as it were. Um, I mean is it is it something that they are very self-consciously constructing or I think it, I think to me it it, it, it is because um, because people uh, because I think in Kalimnos in Greece in general um, once again <laughs> that slippage but uh, from my experience of both and uh, it's it's um, I mean, they're, they're extremely articulate about the importance of food and the importance of being able to talk about food in that way that Sidney Mintz talks about um, uh, his definition of cuisine as the ability to, kind, to mm -hmm. know what other people are eating in your, in your group and to be able to talk about that exactly. in a meaningful way. And, and, and so that's where I kind of come up with this different terms um, I've used robust food culture or gustomology to try and talk about this I know it's an ugly word uh, I was actually going to ask you about that concept yeah. <laughs> it's one of those words that you come up with at one point gustomology and I'm like did anyone follow up with that yeah I mean but I, I think a few people have kind of taken that up but it, it, it really I mean to me the problem with the word cuisine is it, it suggests all those kind of high and low mm -hmm. things and so it, it's very I think my idea is similar to Mintz's um, extending more uh, the, than Mintz's in the sense that he, he particularly he specifically defines it in terms of of talk about food food and talk about food mm -hmm. and I, I, I definitely use that part and especially talk about taste because in calumnos you're not just talking about food you're talking about the taste of food and how do you produce that taste and what how how might you go wrong in producing that taste but it's also i see something that i see as very much part of calumnian rituals mm -hmm. and calumnian social life but when you use the concept of taste here you literally mean how things taste you're not using taste in the That's Brazilian right. sense of uh social class taste. That's right. Um, that is interesting though because now that I think about it in reading your books and articles 
you don't really talk so much about social class in Columbus mm-hmm. when you talk about food. Is that not something that comes up, or is it? It's it's a uh, it's a complicated issue uh, in Greek anthropology. The there's uh, uh, the certainly it in some ways Greece is has similarities to the U.S. in the sense that class is not something that is talked about as defining Mm -hmm. of identity in the way it is in in many places in England, for example. Um, Certainly there are uh, classes and class discourses, but um, you you don't, it doesn't kind of, it doesn't cut through that common knowledge about, it doesn't matter if you're, what class you are in Kalimnos, you still know what these dishes are, how they should taste, and how you should approach that. So aside from gustomological thinking, one of the other core concepts that you evoke in that book is synesthesia. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm wondering to what extent that's connected to a particular way of remembering. I mean, not just thinking about, say, you know, food and color or food and um, history or, you know, but is that a particular way of memory, remembering things? Is it, because you're not, I don't know, perhaps you could just elaborate on synesthesia. Yeah. Yeah. um, I I think that, the way I was using that is as a culturally cultivated way of experiencing uh, sensory interconnection mm. so that um, it becomes very obvious in certain settings, such as in um, the Greek church experience, is very clear that all of the senses are engaged in um, the kind of religious uh, aspects of going into the church, uh, lighting the candles, kissing the icon, um, hearing the uh, this very nasal sound of the um, of the Greek liturgy, um, uh, um, kind of being in this very small space where the the um, the sense of of having others around you uh, it's a very uh, intense experience in the kind of uh, Victor Turner sense mm-hmm. of of ritual um, in some ways taste is the least important although there there is um, Communion it doesn't play as big a part as it does in in Catholic ritual, but uh, but that but that kind of um, stimulation of all the senses also goes into the experience of cooking and eating, uh, and and is once again particularly commented on uh, by. Kalimnians in this phrase, which is more common in Kalimnos than other parts of Greece. I, I haven't done a, uh, a study that would really kind of uh, play this out because obviously um, I think that uh, all, all Greeks have this interest in food, but on Kalimnos they say, listen to the smell of that food. And that was kind of the, the, the once again, the aha moment where, where I'm like, wait a minute, um, what are you saying there? And people were like, oh, yeah, I guess that's weird to say it like that, but that's just how we always said it. <laughs> but professional chefs will say things like that, too. Yeah. You know, the ability, for instance, to hear mm-hmm. when bacon is done, mm-hmm. which is interesting because, you know, you think of it as maybe a visual thing or if it's burnt, a smelling thing. But the fact is that professional chefs will get to a point, and perhaps domestic cooks as well, maybe, I don't know, I may do that myself without really thinking about it where you can be doing two things at once say you have something on the stove and you're working on the counter cutting things up and you can tell when the thing on the stove needs to be stirred by the sound it's making mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I was thinking about something else though and I think the Kalimnian case is perhaps an extreme but it's not unusual 
when you think about what you were talking about a moment ago, this the evoking of all the senses in the church, when you travel, or perhaps not, I mean, when you're, say, doing, you're, you're visiting Klimnos, there are probably certain foods that taste distinct there. Say, I don't know, I always think of feta. Whenever I eat feta, it's, I think of you and your writing because you write a lot about feta. And when you eat feta in perhaps somebody's house in Kalumnos, and let's say you take some of that feta and wrap it up and bring it back to mm-hmm. Carbondale with you, I'm guessing it doesn't taste the same in Carbondale. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if that's because you aren't, in fact, engaging all your senses in the same way in Carbondale. I mean, you obviously are engaging all your senses, it's just you're not in Kalumnos. That's right. Um, and I, I think that's true for a lot of things. You know, when you go to a restaurant and they pair wine with food, and you think, oh, this is fantastic yeah. wine. And then you go buy that wine and bring it home and make dinner, and you're like, or maybe what happened? you were having a romantic evening mm-hmm. in that restaurant, which mm-hmm. is not the same. Yeah, I, I mean, and, and that's, I mean, I think for, for us as anthropologists, and this is something that I think the, the, why it's important for anthropologists to be studying taste, because we, we naturally c- c- see how important that context is mm-hmm. for understanding taste. Um, as opposed to um, sensory scientists who will try and isolate all those things so that they can get at the actual objective taste of something as if we would ever kind of eat something in the context of a laboratory with all white walls and soundproof and all of this. You know, when I'm trying to reconstruct the, the taste of Greek coffee in the U.S., I'm thinking about drinking it while I'm hearing all the motorbikes going by in Kalimnos mm-hmm. and the kind of smell of the of the gasoline and all and the and actually the heat of the sun in Kalimnos in summer is so distinctive to me that all of those combined is is what I'm trying to get at when I take that sip of coffee. Right, and, and so from the moment. From, from the idea that a, a food can trigger memories, you know, to get back to Proust, clearly it can, but it, it, it still is not the same thing as what you just described, yeah. being in that context. That's right. So it's interesting, though, because what, you're, what I'm wondering about here is that if, you could, if you're, you're, you're looking at very specific memories, you know, people's own personal histories, mm-hmm. um, and yet at the same time there are these efforts, this gets back to Mintz, to create ideas of national cuisines um, and I'm wondering to what extent that's really a realistic thing to do I know Mint questioned it yeah. um, it seems problematic if you're if we're connecting it to taste in that way and yet it maybe it's only problematic for anthropologists well I mean my my um, my favorite e- example of how it's problematic is an anecdote that I uh, tell I, I think I don't give uh, use the names, but I may as well uh, now after all this time uh, to um, anthropologists uh, Dimitris Theodosopoulos and uh, Elizabeth Kurtzoglu um, uh, talked to me about when they were living in England. Um, they couldn't have they couldn't make bean stew and share it because um, he was from an island and she was uh, from I think northern Greece I uh, can't remember but but in one case they were making it with tomatoes and in the other case they were making it without tomatoes and so um, just as as we know, kind of the migrant experience, as as Wilk and others have talked about, the migrant experience shapes your sense of national cuisine, um, and and that's when you want to say, oh, I'm eating Greek food, but they were trying to eat Greek food and finding that their image of Greek food was like. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, not connecting with each other, and I think that that's you know that that's obviously um, well, the the problem with kind of taking these regional and local traditions and trying to create mm-hmm. some national 
uh, memories out of them. But, uh, but I will say that one thing that, that is, is not just personal in the sense that there are um, rituals that are shared throughout Greece um, which also underline the food memory relationship very strongly um, and the most prominent one is um, these memorial ceremonies when people die mm -hmm. and you don't just have a funeral when somebody dies it's kind of like in Melanesia or other places where you, um, you're supposed to have a mor memorial ceremony three days after they're dead and nine days and 40 days and three months and, and six months and some places nine months and then a year and then every year afterwards so there are a lot of the, the, these memorial ceremonies are big important rituals and they're very clearly tied to food because they're tied not just because you you eat food at them uh, but because they're supposed to be an extension of the um, generosity of the person who's died after their death. So this is this is part of what I saw as the cultural aspects of food and memory in 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 Greece and Kalymnos was this connection between identity, generosity, and food that meant that people were always offering food to others and this is something that should be taken into as the memory of that person after they died, that they were a generous person, that they gave food away to others. So is this related to the work you've done on commensality? Or is that something different, you think? Because I mean, that seems to be linked to the notion of ritual and of course to the notion of sharing food um, and possibly to generosity, at mm -hmm. least the way you describe it. It, it um, the, I, I think it's a bigger ca category than the commensality, but it includes the commensality because um, the kind of food generosity that I saw on Kalimnos, it would, it would sometimes take the form of inviting someone, sometimes a stranger or somebody just you knew pa in passing or somebody who was like uh, maybe uh, a, a, a traveling merchant who was selling you stuff and saying, you know, come sit, eat with us. Um, that's an experience that tourists have a lot in Greece and, and uh, Hertzfeld has written about some of the power dynam mm -hmm. dynamics of that. And, but I, I think it's also uh, in some ways very genuine and part of that sense that Kalimnians want to know people from other places. They want to know about the outside world. So there's that part, but there's also just the sense that it's so important to um, to be generous with food that I've I've seen you know a 75 year old man um, grab a fish off the grill and run after some some people who had just kind of walked through his yard and said oh that smells good and he said here take it take it <laughs> uh, and the sense that whenever I would go to somebody's house or even be passing their house they would if 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 I wouldn't take anything there they would say oh here have an orange for your son that was uh, my son Sam um, who's filming this but uh, but that so so food generosity is, is a broader car, uh, category uh, about identity and value in the community but commensality is definitely a piece of that um, that broader uh, identity but but what I've been trying to do with commensality more recently is put it in more of a political context mm. of the Greek crisis and and really see how um, eating together becomes uh, a, a form of political mobilization. Right. It, I don't, I, I, let's put that aside for a moment. Mm. I want to go back to this notion of ritual then. You evoked ritual initially there in the context of the church, but I think you mean it 
in a more broad sense, like in terms of people preparing and eating meals, right? Mm -hmm. Can you elaborate a little bit on that, on how a meal is a ritual? Mm -hmm. um, well, I would say that um, it has ritual elements in in all the the different um, parts of it because people are um, sourcing their food uh, in um, particular ways uh, familiar to the island that uh, rely on the kind of cycles of nature on the island so people are collecting snails at a certain time of the year to make uh, a, a, a favorite dish with snails and, and, and tomato. Um, the, the cooking is often collectively done either by a mother and her daughters or there are neighbors around maybe helping you cut things up. Um, they're, um, you're doing it in you're not. You're often not segregated in your kitchen, but you're doing it in your yard. You're mm -hmm. preparing the food in your yard, so you, it's kind of integrated into uh, your other activities. Um, so, so it cuts. It cuts through that kind of ritual daily life distinction in, in interesting ways. In some ways, kind of the eating of the meal. It, uh, it's is funny to me. It it, it has sometimes less elements of ritual on Kalimnos than maybe it does in, in the U.S., for example, because um, people, men and women, are on different schedules. People will eat at different times. Actually sitting down and eating together, that is something fairly special uh, in Kalimnos. Um, obviously for for um, important rituals like Easter and other ritual occasions and and other occasions but there are a lot of times when people will will eat uh, like families will eat in pieces and that's not seen as a problem but beyond ritual you also talk a lot about sort of the social connections people create through like you were just talking now about the when they or how they acquire food mm -hmm. I just remember a story you tell and I don't remember in which I think which book it is about two women going to get grape leaves. Mm -hmm. Do they go to another island to yeah. get them? Yeah. Um, but they seem to have a, a certain sense of how you, you know, who you want to do business with, mm -hmm. how you do business. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, what are the kind of social relations that are being established there? Yeah, it's it's um, a part of a, a, a sense that. Uh, uh, you know, to some might might seem contradictory because it's it's about um, may, it's on the one hand about being generous. I, I wouldn't say I wouldn't use the idea appearing generous because people actually genuinely want to be generous, but they also want to uh, make good deals, mm -hmm. and and so there's there's this strong sense of. Uh, a fair price, um, and a fair price should be should mean that you're not being taken advantage of, and taking it, being taken advantage of means that people are um, profiting off of you rather than simply making a living, mm -hmm. uh, and so um, that's why uh, I found. In, in Kalimnos, as I'm sure in many other places, uh, you know, prices were quite variable depending on who you were, <laughs> and uh, and so I, I always uh, tell my students this story about going to buy a bunch of rugs because uh, they made these very nice rugs uh, in, in these islands, and to take them back to uh, as gifts for friends in the U.S. I went to this store that was on the other side of the island. I, I had never met this store owner. I went in and I spent some time looking around, bargaining with him, came up with this price that we agreed on, and, and I paid him. 
And then as I was leaving, I, I said, um, I asked him something, it was something about like maybe, you know, how often does the bus come or something like that. And at that point he kind of like looked at me and, and kind of did a side eye and he, and he said, you know, wait, are you, you, are you a Kalimnian? And I said, uh, no, I'm not, but I've been living here for a year and a half and I blah, 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 I start telling him this uh, about me and, and he kind of he goes white and he says, oh, I had no idea. He says, um, uh, he reaches into his cash register and he grabs some money, not counting, just grabbing and shoving it into my hand and he says, here, just so you don't think I would try and make a profit off of someone from the island. That's brilliant. <laughs> so, so yeah, I think that the, that um, those uh, the, I, I really found that that there was a moral economy of shopping uh, on Kalimnos that was particularly kind of I think interesting relate interestingly related to kind of ideas about food as a moral economy. Mm -hmm. So that might have something to do with why social class isn't the, isn't the same as it might be, say, in other countries, because there is this egalitarian kind of um, that's right ethos there that you wouldn't have, say, in London or, or for that matter, in I don't know Tuscany, to think of other places where I've seen people write about social class. Right. Um, that's really interesting. So the so you get from this this sense of memory to the sense of moral economy. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start talking about the techniques of cooking, mm -hmm. which I find fascinating. In part because I don't know how many times I've had conversations with you in which you have evoked somebody doing something inadvisable with a knife. <laughs> um, and yet you've never mentioned anybody cutting their fingers yeah. off. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your, your interest in sort of the bodily techniques of, of learning to cook? Um, and how and how did you come to that interest and, and, and how have you pursued it? Yeah, um, it... Um, it came out of, as I was writing about memory, um, it, was, it was actually a colleague of mine at University of Illinois, Janet Dixon Keller, who said, um, well, you realize that cooking is a memory process too. And I was like, it was like, oh, yeah, you're right. Um, and I started to think about um, how to approach, how I would approach cooking as a memory process and I started by thinking about kind of ideas about recipes. Are recipes written down? Do you use recipes? Um, the idea of recipes as, as memory jogs for people, obviously as most people who cook know, you, you, don't, you don't learn to cook by reading recipes, but you might still use them mm -hmm. in this way to jog your memory. And, um, but, but it was actually in talking with Janet about her research uh, uh, that she did with her husband, Charles Keller, on um, blacksmiths. I think I had shown some of the, my first videos that I had, that I had been taking in Kalimnia and kitchens and she had said well you know in some ways that's like the blacksmith's workshop and they have all their tools on the mm -hmm. wall and they and they use the the kind of layout of the kitchen as a memory jog to remind them well I'm doing this I can grab this tool and and apply it to this process and and that really got me thinking of the kitchen as a as a total environment, uh, a social and a material environment, and of of tool use as a kind of extension of the body. And I started reading stuff on that um, that uh, that talked about um, how tools extend our our capacities and and that in some cases made the distinction between tools and technologies, technologies that 
separated us from the processes of cooking mm -hmm. and tools that allowed us to do other things with our bodies. Uh, other people might object to that distinction, but I found it interesting at least to think about ethnographically is, is there a difference between uh, kind of what we think of as, as kitchen tools and the kind of things like uh, blenders and food processors and, and of course it's, it's a, it's a it's pop, maybe a problematic distinction as I'm saying if you go back and look at Julia Child she's using blenders you know to teach cooking way back when but she also has exactly that what you just described mm -hmm. all the tools arrayed on the wall that's right you can go see that at the Smithsonian now if you want. Yeah. And I was actually um, thinking, when I started out this project, I was working with a graduate student uh, of mine, Michael Hernandez, mm -hmm. and uh, he was very interested in the kind of Pierre Bourdieu approach because he said, you know, all of my friends who have all of the, that stuff on the walls, they never use them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're there for display rather than for actual use, and I had to think about that. But once again, that, that, that wasn't what was going on in Kalimnos. Either they were using them like the blacksmith, or if, the, if it was there for display, it was a different kind of display. It wasn't like those beautiful copper pans that people hang from their, uh, what do you call it, things in the middle of their islands. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it was, um, in some cases, Kalimnians had started to kind of take the tools from their grandmothers and great grandmothers and hang them up on in, in their kitchens as kind of uh, objects of memory, objects of tradi representing you, tradition. I'm trying to remember if this is. I hope it's you, because I feel like there's a, you're the only person I think I've read about whose work I've read has been that is focused on kitchens in Greece. Mm. Um, Aren't there different kinds of kitchens? Like, I seem to remember that there would be like the mother's kitchen and the daughter's yeah. kitchen, and sometimes the men would have cooking spaces outside. That's right. Has there been any effort to like consolidate those, or has there been a movement to sort of, uh, I want to call it this, to renovate kitchens in the sense that, you know, you go all over Europe now and everything seems to be IKEA mm -hmm. everywhere. Um, and whether it's, you know, the Czech Republic or France mm -hmm. or England. Um, and I'm wondering if that's seeped down into into Kalimnos as well. No, I haven't seen it on on Kalimnos. I I do. I I mean, it's possible that it's happening in Athens, uh -huh. um, but uh, the the uh, the only examples of of that kind of kitchen that you're describing that I saw in Kalimnos was. Um, somebody who had lived in the U.S. for 25 years and then moved back and kind of tried to reconstruct their U.S. kitchen in Kalimnos. But, uh, but the kitchen renovations I saw going on like 10, 10 15 years ago in Kalimnos were much more kind of neo-traditional in that they were, um, if they didn't have the outdoor oven mm -hmm. that the man might use or the woman might use, um, uh, which was something that um, shepherds had in the old days to cook when they were kind of spending time on the mountain mm -hmm. <laughs> taking care of their sheep. Or rich people might have, but not everybody had. But now, if, if you could, you, you would build that. And, and certainly they were preserving that distinction of mother's kitchen and daughter's kitchen because it's such a useful way to um, uh, have the daughter's kitchen as a place that doesn't get dirty so you can bring people into, whereas the mother's kitchen is outside. You can have, you can clean fish, you can, mm. you can cook the, the, the smellier things and have it all kind of go away. So people were, were definitely preserving that idea. It, it, this is kind of a side issue, but I was just thinking about how many of the things you've been evoking here are, are things that can be used comparatively when we're talking about, say, the anthropology of food in the United States mm. or the rest of Europe. Um, you know, the different idea of who owns the kitchen, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, when we were 
renovating our kitchen here, um, at some point my father said that I should let my wife handle it because it's her kitchen. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was literally what he said. I do most of the cooking. I did then too. It wasn't like, and he knew that. <laughs> he knew that. But yeah. nevertheless, yeah. it's her kitchen. Now, as it happened, she designed the kitchen and it's great. I and I still do most of the cooking, but I really like it. But it was just interesting that this, this, this was an automatic category. Um, that, you know, that distinction is not something we would necessarily think about unless we have this kind of comparative anthropology to put the U.S. kitchen in that context and think, aha, so in some places they really do this. Um, I'm curious, though, about the apprenticeship of learning to cook. I mm -hmm. didn't learn to cook from my mother. Mm -hmm. But it, clearly in... Um, in 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 Calamos, that's precisely what people do and when i say people no no <laughs> because that was that's what people say they do that's right yeah <laughs> but then you know then i find this like completely different layer and that's when I, I i wrote a little bit about cooking and memory for uh, the remembrance of her past and and i just kind of took what people said at, at face value at the time, but when I actually did the ethnography, I find out that um, that the majority of people are the majority of women are not learning from their mothers, and it's and it's because of this very interesting kind of comparative little tidbit that I mentioned earlier. Because it's matrifocal, it's also matrilocal, and you have mothers and daughters living together. Well, you would think. They would, that would be the perfect environment mm -hmm. for learning from the daughter, learning from the mother. But in fact, what ha what would happen is that the mother would um, keep control of the kitchen and not share it with her daughter. And and the kind of plus side of that was that the 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 daughter could go out and work uh, as more women kind of entered the workforce while the mother was still the one making the meal, or even if she wasn't kind of working in a job, she could be doing stuff in the fields or stuff, mm. something like that. Um, but the kind of other element of it was that, you know, mothers, it, you know, that ownership of the, the knowledge of cooking was something that uh, mothers didn't want to be preempted on. And of course we can think of a lot of comparative examples from, I, I've had people from Italy especially tell me these stories, but even in the US I feel like, you know, the kind of refusal to give up the, the secret ingredient mm -hmm. for the recipe because it's your recipe and it's only when you die <laughs> that you might think about passing it on. And so I found that that was, that was really um, strong in Kalimnos and it led to this kind of sense that if daughters, how do daughters learn to cook? Well, mostly they learn through um, just picking it up surreptitiously um, or sharing knowledge horizontally in their own age group of what, what uh, people, uh, uh, their friends knew. Um, or kind of slowly being incorporated into the tasks of cleaning the fish or soaking the beans and all of that, but not being given the whole picture by the mother. So you kind of get getting it in pieces. But um, uh, it was, I think, I found it was very similar to what uh, Michael Hertzfeld had described for um, the male potters in, in Crete who mm -hmm. took apprentices on but then didn't teach them anything with the expectation that the apprentices, if they were good, should be able to quote unquote steal the knowledge from their masters. That's funny. Yeah. There's actually the, the parallel I was just thinking of, there's a book that just came out that I have not yet read called, I think it's called Crying in H Mart and I don't remember the name of the author, she's a musician. Um, and her band is called Japanese Breakfast, but she... I've heard of this band, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but she is um, of mixed Korean and American heritage, and her Korean mother died of cancer, and when her mother was had cancer, um, she went to take care of her and was trying to learn to cook Korean mm. food, um, and didn't really, and they had a, a Korean woman who was helping them at home and also refused to teach her, 
you know, because these are just not things that you teach. You have yeah. to pick it up on your own. That's right. And in fact, she's picked up a lot of it apparently from, I think her name is Mong Chi. It's a, oh, yeah, yeah. I've, I've watched um, that one. <laughs> it, we've actually used some of the Mong Chi recipes. They're great. Yeah. But, you know, it was it's a good example precisely of what you're talking about. Yeah. It's like her mother wouldn't teach her. The, the, help, the helping Korean woman wouldn't teach her. Yeah. But they expected her, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I don't know if they expected her to learn or if she just felt the need to learn because right. she wanted to recapture that heritage. Um, all right, so there's this sense of learning to cook. One of the other things I wanted to talk about, though, was some of the tools that people use because they're really interesting. Um, I was really struck, for instance, by their insistence on using dangerous can openers um, or not using cutting boards. Um, is this just tradition or is it stubborn? You know, because they can't... I know that they watch television cooking shows, so they know that there are mm -hmm. other options out there. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I'm sure you can buy those other tools in stores on the island, um, or if not, in Greece. So why, why stick with these old tools? What, mm -hmm. is, what is going on there? Um, I think it, it depends um, on... I, I think there's a there's a number of things going on. It was really interesting to try and parse out um, because I was confronted with this uh, when seeing how Kalimnians use knives, and I, I you know the like the first insight in in this research was this this fact that uh, Kalimnian uh, well all Kalimnians they cut everything holding it in their hands whether it's a, an onion or a potato or a zucchini or a, uh, an eggplant, um, uh, which is just really beautiful to see somebody slicing an eggplant just holding it in their hands because it, it takes a lot of skill. Or the, the, the baguettes that they would eat every day that they would hold against that they would actually use their chest and kind of cut like this, which I thought was the most <laughs> interesting, scary thing to it, watch. It reminds me of the, the men who sell coconuts on the side of the road in Martinique who use, they cut, they, they have machetes. And they just hold it in their hand, and yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I would no longer have fingertips yeah. <laughs> if I did that. You know, it's it's amazing. Um, that, that's right. And um, and it it was partly um, once again, I, I I because most people didn't have uh, traditionally this sense of like buying expensive kitchen tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, there, there was a little bit of that uh, that uh, came in with food TV in the early 2000s uh, and when the economic situation was much better. But people were always kind of like, we can use the tools at hand and we have the skill to make them work. So people would just grab any knife to like cut something with and it wasn't like, oh, I have to have my nice... Um, uh, sharp knife and all of that, which which is something I think I've picked up too in my own cooking. I, I have the lousiest knives and I cook all the time and I think, oh, I probably should buy <laughs> nicer knives, but I never do. Um, I, I think that uh, the, the other thing that I found um, was that um, like with, with, the, with the can openers, there was really a sense that you had this kind of embodied skill that you that you didn't want to like give up to adapt to the new the newfangled version. Yeah, they're crazy those newfangled candles. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I know. Uh, I, I actually we just bought one like six months ago, and it took me and my and my wife and my son standing around for twenty minutes where we finally figured out how it worked. That's hilarious. Um, but in fact, it's, it's funny because the woman who, um, who told me, you know, she wasn't going to change can openers because she was a traditional person. And that's, that's just, the, it just went with her personality to use this knife can opener that created all the jagged edges. And then she had to hammer them down with one of the kind of things that was like a blacksmith's tool. Um, uh, I found um, like five years later that they had they were like selling uh, the pull top cans 
in Calumnos, and she had she had bought a bunch of those for cans of tomatoes, and so she was opening the cans, of, just pulling off the can, and and we were laughing about uh, the changes and how she had become modern now because she was using. But it's also part of this um, Calumnian sense that all of these everyday things, like, do have this kind of um, larger significance in this question of who you are. Uh, whether you embrace tradition or think of yourself as a modern person. So that was, the, so I actually want to talk to you about your research techniques, but mm. before we do that, let's talk about this modernity versus tradition mm. thing, because I think it's really uh, striking, because that, that comes up a lot. Um, you know, on one hand, there is this sense that it's a traditional place where they have strange traditions like throwing dynamite. Yes. Um, which, by the way, you know, the first time I think I read that article, I had to imagine it, but it turns out you can Google it and uh, you can see YouTube yeah. videos of it. And uh, they're quite terrifying, yes. actually. And those are just videos, so yeah. I can only imagine what it's like <laughs> in real life. Um, seems like another bad idea that people really shouldn't throw dynamite. But yeah, Well, I, let, let me just kind of pick up on that because mm -hmm. that, that was where I kind of saw this connection because... Um, a uh, number of anthropologists, once again Michael Hirschfeld, but also his student uh, Thomas Malaby, have written about risk in Greece um, and kind of the, the existential value of embracing risk in your mm. everyday life. And dynamite, I think, is an example of, of that kind of belief that life is worth living is kind of it's not like kind of extreme extreme sports which is very individualistic because once again this is very kind of part of the social life there so it doesn't have that kind of individualism thing but it definitely has a sense that you give your life meaning by not shying away from risks or trying to minimize risk and um, and but they were writing all about men and a few anthropologists have actually write, written about, uh, like Heather Paxson, have written about uh, risk in birth control techniques in Greece, so talking about women. But, but I felt that um, the things like the, the, the way that they use the knives and the can openers were part of that kind of embracing of risk as, as having value. Well, what about this notion of tradition? Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, the, when I think about traditional modernity, I don't think about, just for anybody who happens to watch this who isn't an anthropologist, I'm not thinking about actual tradition and actual modernity, mm -hmm. whatever those might be, right. but rather the categories that people use right. to, to describe things. You know, and, and that comes up in a lot of different places, you know, where there are people who, as you just pointed out, call themselves traditionalists mm -hmm. versus people who think of themselves as modernists. Um, how does that play out in your work? Um, you know, what's at stake in making those claims? Right. Um, I think that uh, it it started out for me in exactly looking at kind of how they were defining tradition and how they were defining, they didn't use the word modernity, but something like the contemporary uh, in discourses about the past mm -hmm. and how that as you as you say the kind of the material content of that could be pretty shifty mm -hmm. <laughs> but then when I got to thinking about um, uh, food and cooking it really seemed to be also having a direct reference to these ideas about um, precision quantification, all of the things that um, are associated with a certain image of modernity as rationality and as kind of being scientific. And so it got me interested in thinking about the ways that, that food gets put into those kind of d distinctions between the rational and the irrational sometimes defined as tradition um, so that you have the contrast between uh, the 
the uh, and how that how that's been used to denigrate often de denigrate female knowledge in mm -hmm. particular as old wives tales and things like that whereas um, the kind of uh, public professional chefs especially the ones kind of using what uh, was called uh, molecular gastronomy, although I know that that's changed over well, but time. But this fits perfectly into this discussion because yeah. what it's called now is modernist cuisine. Modernist cuisine, right? Yes. And in fact, you again. I'm sorry, I'm mixing up all of your publications now in my head. But it's at some point you talk about this. Is it the bechamel sauce story? You know, they're making a a version of a dish. Mm -hmm. Actually, it, okay, so this is a completely different story. But there are versions that the modernist cuisine people try to use to try and achieve perfection. Mm -hmm. and, and Cook's Illustrated is an example of this as well, but they're trying to find the, the perfect hard-boiled egg, or the one that I often discuss with my students is this video of, um, what's his name, Nathan Mervold and some chef making the perfect hamburger. Mm. It takes them 36 hours to make the perfect <laughs> hamburger. And I look at it, and it looks like a hamburger, and I think, but it's not the perfect hamburger. The if there is such a thing, the perfect hamburger is when my daughter and I spend some time in the kitchen making a hamburger together. That's right. Hamburgers. And, and no, they're not as pretty as Nathan Murfold's hamburgers, but they first of all don't take 36 hours. And second of all, they're good, you know, and we have a nice meal together. So, I, you know, I'm wondering if that's sort of the, the contrast here between this supremely modern, perfected technology thing and what we actually do. I mean, I'm not yeah. doing modernist cuisine in my kitchen. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, and and in fact, uh, um, in the this um, book that I've been working on, that's that's uh, coming out uh, in fall of 2021, um, I I spend a fair amount of time talking uh, exactly about that the the kind of the contrast between. Um, what makes cooking cooking on Kalimnos, which to uh, which to me is defined by its possibility of not just possibility of failure, but the fact that it's it's is not going to be the same every time, mm -hmm. and the kind of image that you get either at the at the at the kind of low level by with fast food. Uh, any McDonald's hamburger is the same wherever you get it. And at the high level with modernist cuisine that you can kind of control temperature and, and everything through. The techniques uh, are the same, by the way, at those two levels. Yeah, yeah. I know. And the the technology. The, there's, yeah, the, there's, yeah uh, exactly. And so that idea of, um, of the perfect, which is so prevalent, uh, maybe, I don't know if it's changing at all, but... But certainly, I, I've, I see it all over the place. The perfect way to cut an onion, which of course would be like ridiculous on Calibnos because you just don't do it that way. And and uh, John Finn has actually written this this great article about that idea of the perfect in cooking, and he sees it as as basically fascist. Maybe he's 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 exaggerating a little bit, but there's something there I think um, that I've tried to contrast to this idea of context again, mm -hmm. just as with taste. So if you could think about that bechamel in the uh, in the uh, moussaka, that was the dish, right? Yeah. In that that story, I was struck by that because so. First of all, you should probably tell the story because not everybody's read the article. Mm -hmm. But second of all, I was struck by the notion that it could end up with something that other people wouldn't agree was moussaka. Um, and I, I want to riff on that, but first, why don't you tell the story and then... Yeah, uh, one of the things that then that I was interested in and that I'm exploring in this, in this book is that um, if, if the idea that... Um, Every time you make a recipe, you take a risk, mm -hmm. and you 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 in fact you can't control all of the circumstances. You can't control the ingredients. Um, you um, you can't control you know who's going to be coming in interrupting you. All of these things, and and that's accepted uh, in Kalimnos. Uh Once again, it's accepted because it's like 
it may be because it's not public cooking where you're supposed to have this standard of, of reproducibility. But anyway, in thinking about how you make a recipe over and over again, it was both a kind of ethnographic project to me to kind of s like how interesting it would be to just document people cooking the same dish repeatedly over the course of a year, two years, something like that. But one of the things that I found was that um, people aren't just dealing with contingencies, but they're actually, they're of course using creativity um, as a way of responding to contingencies. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and, and Kalimnia said the secret to being a good cook was to be able to master tricks. And mastering tricks was a way of dealing with contingency. And once again, it kind of fit into uh, Greek ideas that applied to the, the potters that Hertzfeld studied and things like that. And, um, and so basically, um, it, in the case of this um, moussaka, you were supposed to pour the bechamel sauce on top of um, the, the um, eggplant and potatoes and mm -hmm. meat that you had layered into the, the pan. Well, this, this woman had made her um, bechamel sauce and she was pouring it in and she realized that um, she had made a little too much and it was going to overflow her, her, um, her pan. And so she grabbed a, a, a paintbrush that she had been using for uh, a craft project and she, she turned it upside down and she used the, the handle of the paintbrush to start stirring so that the, the bechamel would be absorbed into the layers of the moussaka. And when it turned out, she said, wow, this is really good. <laughs> um, you know, we've got that bechamel running through the, the, the dish instead of just, as she called it, a brick on the top. And so she kind of denigrated the traditional way of, mm -hmm. of eating it and, and said, you know, here's, a, here's an innovation and it's one that I think I would like to stick with. And I said, well, what did, um, what did your friends and neighbors say when you told them about it? And because, of course, people t talk about these things all the time. And, and they said, well they, well, they said, that's not moussaka. And, and she said, but to me it still is moussaka and I'm going to, and I'm going to keep making it in moussaka. And so I was kind of thinking about that and thinking about that as, as a possible route to innovations that, you know, maybe just she picked it up and, and it died with her, or maybe a couple of friends picked it up, or um, maybe it spread through the community, mm -hmm. just as other things kind of start to spread through the community the way that um, people in Greece cook their potatoes with meat, whether they let the, the juice of the meat kind of absorb into the potatoes, which is considered traditional, or make kind of a French fry thing, which is uh, newfangled. But if you think about it, the controversy over what constitutes a signature dish, mm. which comes to symbolize a community, is it's a pretty common controversy. Um, but it's also kind of a false, um, false isn't perhaps the right term. People throw out these things as if there was a, a, a hard and fast definition of what, say, moussaka mm -hmm. is. Um, and perhaps I have an expectation from going to Greek restaurants in America of what moussaka is since I've never been to Greece. But um, but I have no idea if what they're serving is what people would serve in, say, Kalimnos. Um, and we have those controversies here in New Orleans around things like gumbo. Mm. Although what's interesting is people here do recognize that there are a lot of variations. You know, if you ask what's the best gumbo, the typical answer is my mother's or my grandmother's, mm -hmm. um, which may have okra in it or it may not, or it may have uh, andouille sausage in it or it may not, or it might have chicken or it might not. Some people put potato salad in their, in their gumbo and some wow. people think that's a, you know, a, a terrible thing to do. So there's a, a lot of different variations. On the other hand, when Disney, for instance, a few years ago on some cooking show had some guy making, I think it was Disney, making gumbo 
everybody agreed that it was a horror. Yeah. Um, and there was a lot of social media, you know, making fun of it and outrage. So there's a, it may, it may not be what actually goes into the dish so much as who's making it and where they're making it and who's sponsoring the making of it that, that causes the scandal. Well, David, this has been really fascinating. I have about a million more questions to ask you, um, but I don't know that we have time to explore them all. And thank you very much. And we'll talk more, I'm sure, in the future. It was my pleasure. Thank you.